I just wanted to thank you all for being here, um, and I want to thank people in particular, Kimberly, Ducey, Carla Miqueda, Catherine Taylor, and the students in the sociology department, Lord Colonelson in human rights, Michelle Owen, disability studies, Lisa McLean in the dean's office, uh, Marina Britton, Denise Ibrahim, Greg Chase, and Eric Rohde for uh, getting all of this together. Um, it's sort of been a great um, sort of process uh, over, the, over the last few months, I suppose, of, uh, of getting this done. And, and I want to thank this sort of really dynamic group uh, with interdisciplinary interest for being here and giving me some time to talk about this uh, book project. So I want to begin, um, I guess, with an anecdote. Um, so in 2017, uh, the Republicans replace, uh, repeal and replace of Obamacare threatened, in Senator Bob Casey's words, uh, freedom and liberty accorded in the Americans with Disabilities Act. According to the disability advocacy and protest group ADAPT, it would be so damning to people with disabilities that none of the disability rights work matters with the passing and the gutting of our Medicare long-term services and supports. In June of 2017, ADAPT uh, protested at Mitch McConnell's office where this photograph um, on the slide was taken. 43 protesters, protesters were arrested. This isn't just about cutting aid that would allow disabled people to live in the community. It's also fundamentally about civil rights. This is but another episode in a long political battle and began really in the 1940s and 1950s when rehabilitation policies and concurrently the deinstitutionalization movement uh, made both liberal and conservative lawmakers favor uh, vocational and educational programs, uh, particularly as an alternative to warehousing disabled people in, in asylums and institutions and also over providing cash, uh, directly uh, cash benefits to um, recipients. And by the 1970s, the independent living movement, which began at Berkeley and then spread across university campuses uh, in the United States, um, uh, really further pushed for accommodation so that people with disabilities could live and interact with the campus community more easily. But progress was slow, and it was incremental. So in this photograph, this, this is at, uh, right outside of Mitch, uh, the S uh, Speaker Mitch McConnell's office in DC. Uh, there, is, uh, there are four Capitol Police uh, or five Capitol Police uh, in, the, in the photograph with disability protesters uh, uh, in the background. One, is, one protester is in a wheelchair and is, I guess, speaking to or being spoken to by a Capitol Police. Uh, and then three Capitol Police uh, are um, dragging one of the protesters um, across the, um, the floor. And in fact, I believe in this, in, in this particular incident in event, uh, the Capitol Police actually dropped one of the protesters and that was also in the, uh, in the news at that time. So it was a very interesting and very important event. Activists uh, and also uh, sympathetic legislators soon uh, discovered that this um, process of, 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 of independent living was actually slow and incremental from, from a policy point of view. Activists uh, and, and, and lawmakers uh, soon learned that the federal um, uh, funding bias uh, sorry, the federal funding biased nursing home care um, and the nursing home industry at the state level had tremendous clout over state legislatures. Uh, even after the Americans with Disabilities Act was put into law um, in the early 1990s and 1990, uh, hopeful something would happen, uh, you know, disability activists and legislators uh, uh, looked to Clinton, uh, the Clinton administration, and they sort of targeted the, his campaign offices, they lobbied, um, they used disruptive action to really get in-home care as part of health care reform. Um, Clinton in turn told groups to lobby Congress if they wanted effective change. In the end, Clinton and his administration favored uh, leaving this up to these states. By the mid-90s, Republican Speaker Newt Gingrich proposed amendments to the Social Security Act uh, called MiCASA, which would allow individuals eligible for nursing home uh, funds to use these instead for community-based care um, or community-based attendant programs. Um, this had bipartisan support. Uh, in fact, it was another example of the Clinton administration working together with the Republicans at that time. For example, uh, we hear this a lot when we hear about welfare reform. In, in that, it was around the same period of time. But despite institutional and grassroots support for this, the law never made it out of committee. And this led to more protests um, at the close of that decade, at the close of the 1990s. So lawmakers thought they had new ammo with uh, a pivotal Supreme Court case called the Olmstead case in 1999, which struck a blow to institutionalization. 
But in 2001, 2002, and then again in 2003, um, three new versions of Mikasa were introduced and went nowhere. So this de decade-long debate um, fueled ADAPT's protest. Both Republican and Democratic legislators were looking to get this policy done and instead sought compromises to altering Medicare as a way to sort of move, get some action on this policy. But ultimately, the Obama administration failed to pursue community care as part of health care reform. Um, ADAPT protesters chained themselves to the White House fence. As protesters chanted, free our people, one protester exclaimed, all they want to talk about was them implementing MFP, which is money follows the person. That was the last administration. What is this administration going to do? So money follows the person was supported by the, the previous administration, the Bush administration. It didn't touch Medicare, but what it would do instead was give upfront money to, uh, to states, which would encourage, but it would not require, would not require attendant care programs. So community care was ultimately abandoned um, in compromises to get Obamacare uh, passed. So in effect, the program remained optional. So this case brings out several important themes that I want to touch on today. The first is that politics and policy evolve over very long periods of time um, in a kind of forward and backward trajectory. So it's not evolutionary in, that, in the sense of starting from point A and now we're at point B in this kind of evolutionary tra uh, trajectory. The second is that political entrepreneurs matter on both sides of the aisle. Um, they create spaces for issues to flourish on the policy agenda. Uh, they, in other words, create political opportunities. The third is that institutions can either facilitate or they can hinder activism. Fourth, advoc advocacy and activism through both institutional and extra-institutional means matters. And this is especially true when insider activists or, or lawmakers um, face barriers in trying to affect change. Fifth is that political compromises to get things done and kind of desire for bipartisanship um, can actually produce policies nobody wants and nobody cares about. And thus, the question should be, why defend policies that nobody cares about and nobody wants? And finally, and relatedly, policy half solutions keep these policy areas unsettled. Uh, they can facilitate retrenchment. They decrease issue salience. Um, they can demobilize constituents. And all of this can affect whether or not policies actually deliver the goods that they promise to deliver. So Politics of Empowerment, uh, the, book that I, the book that I'm talking to you about today, addresses several big questions um, within which this particular talk should be understood. How and why do institutions change? To what extent is this change endogenous or exogenous so it, within or outside of uh, these organizations? To what is, what is the role of, of both insider elites or political entrepreneurs and so-called outside actors in promoting um, and affecting social change? And how are political constituencies formed? And why, when, and how do they mobilize? So my main argument is that policies make new politics by changing the rules of the game, by taking ideas and manifesting them into programmatic changes. So they change the rules of the game, and policies create or take ideas and make them into manifesting themselves into real, practical programs. And in doing so, policies shape the interaction between communities and the state. Policies turn clients of social services into a minority group, a minority group entitled to civil rights. And this was an important basis for subsequent mobilization. Policy making and the way policies evolve is really a cycle of innovation, retrenchment, mobilization, and restoration. Rinse and repeat. All of this means that we need to know the following. How did disability rights get onto the policy agenda to begin with? How did detractors emerge to curb policy uh, enforcement? What has been the role of the disability rights movement and the disability community in mobilizing against uh, lack of policy enforcement or policy retrenchment? And what are the outcomes of this mobilization? So what I'm trying to understand is why decades-old disability rights policies continue to face political threats, um, you know, rendering these policies unable to produce these public goods that they were intending to produce. So what's so interesting about um, the politics of disability. Well, this policy participation cycle that I mentioned before is not unique to disability. Um, in fact, the claim that policies make politics has been explored via the gray lobby, um, the women's movement, the right to choose, sexual harassment politics, 
and even environmental politics. The case of disability should be understood within that context. And that in that, it points to some particularly important aspects of issue development, political evolution, and lawmaking that makes this disability especially interesting. Remember that disability is part of the early development of America's so-called belated welfare state. Uh, disability, because of that, has always had a presence on the policy agenda. Not coincidentally, it has a very old and established nonprofit sector. Many disability organizations historically enjoyed very close ties to lawmakers and uh, to policymakers. And all of this means that basically disability rights entered into an existing organizational, political, and cultural field right, that was already do dominated by an extant paradigm. Right? It was, there was already a well-entrenched way uh, about how to think and deal with disability. And that was not as a minority group entitled to civil rights. Um, in other words, the issue came with baggage, right? Um, a, policy, um, a policy understanding was already in place that disability rights had to contend with. So about, uh, on this uh, slide here, I have a graph that uh, shows um, some um, kind of a, ma I call it a macro context graph, but it's also kind of a historical graph if you think about it that way. But the graph basically, um, and I, I have it in some of the handouts, the, the graph shows um, change in the number of organizations founded, the number of disability groups founded, the number of hearings that um, Congress held, and the number of protest events between 1961 and 2006. And what the graph shows is that for a, a big chunk of that period, so from, the from 1961 till about the enactment of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, you kind of see the growth of both the nonprofit sector and also the growth in the number of hearings that were held by Congress during that period of time. You also see sort of the rise of direct action protests during that period of time, which is uh, identified by that uh, dotted line at the bottom. There are some impor other important um, points to take away from here. The first is that important period between 1961 and, and, the late, and the late 1980s, which is the period I'm going to talk about here the most. It is important because it is here where three things are happening. You have, the, again, the rise of protest, you have the rise of uh, agenda space dedicated to issues of disability, and you also have the proliferation of disability groups, which is different from the situation following the Americans with Disabilities Act, where you actually see for the first time in years a contraction in the disability organizational field. You see a, a very strong decline in the number of hearings that Congress is dedicating to disability following the ADA, which is that, that straight up kind of red line. And then you also see a sort of decline in protest. And just a note about protest, and this is based on my content analysis over, of protests over 45 years across four newspapers. Um, and what is interesting about protests is relative to other social movements, there, there's definitely fewer direct action protests overall I, I, with disability rights. But I think what's more important is that, um, that there are really actually two waves of protest. The first wave, which is I'm going to refer to the most, is this first wave of protest that was happening just around the kind of 1970s and 1980s. A lot of it was a response to this sort of government seemingly providing rights and then trying to take them away. It was, it was what generated that protest. The other kind of protests really emerged around the time of the ADA. But what's interesting about those protests is that the protests weren't directly engaging with federal policies per se, but much of that protest was targeting local and state as well as um, uh, some municipal and, direct, and, for example, public transit companies. Uh, those were the targets of those protests. They may have invoked legislation, but they weren't targeting the federal government. But right now, I really want to draw specific attention to the 70s and 80s, not because I was born then, but because <laughs> they're a very interesting period of time. Um, uh, it's, again, this period of, pro of continued proliferation and growth, uh, and also it tells us a lot about where we are today when it comes to disability politics in the United States. OK. So how did disability rights get onto the policy agenda? Like, what, how did that happen? Well, it's important to provide some historical context here. So throughout much of the first half of the 20th century, a policy monopoly of members of Congress, the, the administration, of course, the executive branch, and established disability groups, like, for example, the Easter Seals, Goodwill, uh, revolved almost exclusively around the provision of social services, namely rehabilitation, right? which, which really began in 1920 at the federal level. They dominated policy discourse, and by doing so, they excluded alternative policy understandings of disability. Um, 
the way that they understood disability were, was that disability, people with disabilities were clients, right? And that's how they should interact with the state. This monopoly was facilitated by the institutional arrangements of that time. So it, it's important to put, again, why history matters. And I mean, I'm not a historian, but I can appreciate why it does matter. It's important to remember that in the 1940s and 50s, committees were controlled by a seniority system that kept s conservative Southern Democrats, or Dixiecrats, in powers, leadership positions, right? And that really worked to kill any liberal sounding legislation that might come from any of these committees. For example, Graham Barden, who I believe is a Democrat from North Carolina, uh, and he chaired the House Education and Labor Committee, where, and this is important, in the 1950s, two thirds of all disability hearings held by Congress were held by that committee, okay? Chaired by Graham Barton, who referred to rehabilitation as gobbledygook. Uh, and, and that's a quote, and I, I forgot to do air quotes. Gobbledygook. That's a real thing from the congressional record, okay. Um, and, so this is, and so this is important to, to, to sort of keep this. Um, this, this historical context in mind when, when, when we're talking about this. You know, and it's also very important to note that disability groups were not really trying to work outside the system. They were part of that system. They were part of that system. But even in this kind of status quo period, which other people have commented on, the 1940s and 50s being a deadlock of democracy, there was a really significant change happening here. You have to remember the 50s, McCarthyism, right? This is that post-World War II period. Uh, it, there, there wasn't any really significant social change, but e despite that, there were signs, um, or at least efforts by actors to lay the groundwork for more significant change to come. First, these legislators, along with not disability nonprofit organizations, effectively promoted a policy alternative to institutionalization, which was rehabilitation. It was like ex explicitly framed as, this is an alternative to institutionalization. The second thing that was going on around this period of time as a consequence of this focus on rehabilitation was a disability type or the nature of disability became secondary to what kind of client the person would be. In other words, how, how and I'm going to always mispronounce this, how rehabilitatable they are, or as another word that's used is educable. And while this might seem backwards, it did have the effect of thinking of disability more generally as a as a community of actors rather than as disparate actors with, uh, with um, um, different interests. So this is important. And the third important development that was going on again in this kind of period of seeming status quo is that through an emphasis on moral obligations, um, moral obligations to help the deserving poor, which is a strong part of the development of the American welfare state, and a desire to economically integrate people to be taxpayers versus tax burdens, um, they moved closer to addressing obstacles people with disabilities face in everyday life, which would eventually include discrimination, but not quite yet. So all of this kind of this groundwork was kind of being laid uh, prior to any significant expansion of congressional hearings, which itself is a symbol or sign or effect of changing institutional arrangements. So what kinds of changes are we talking about here? Well, the first was electoral turnover. So by the end of the 50s and in the early 1960s, more liberal northern Democrats and, and liberal Republicans um, came, to, came to Congress. At the same time, and as partly as a result of that, the seniority system that had kept all these conservative Dixiecrats in powerful positions was falling apart. Both of these uh, factors loosened that policy monopoly, that stronghold that this group of, of legislators and uh, nonprofit organizations had. Um, and part of that was that these new legislators and policymakers were entering the arena with new ideas, right? new ideas that in the past may not have been entertained. It also meant that other committees and their respective members began getting interested in the issues of disability beyond just that one or two, those one or two committees that were sort of where, where most of that discussion was happening in that period of time. So this incremental shift um, actually had several important, or led to several important socio-political socio developments. And the first has to do with um, political innovations and how political entrepreneurs shepherded in those political innovations. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take this particular period of time. Very short period of time, 1968 to 1971, so a few years. Three key things happened that were very important to the, to the, 
the socio, historical, and political story of disability rights. The first was the passage of the Architectural Barriers Act of 1968. So it was introduced in 67, passed in 68. This law required that the construction of new government buildings had to be made accessible. This was important. It was important because for the first time, this was a, a policy that wasn't about doing something to people with disabilities, but rather to do something to the environment to facilitate people with disabilities accessing federal government or public buildings. The second important uh, event, uh, process that was occurring around this period of time was the development of accessible transit and that political struggle to the right of equal tr access to public transit, which still occurs, which is still an issue today, but it's sort of flourishing in this period of time. Neither of these policy um, developments, whether it was equal uh, right, rights to tra uh, equal access to transit or um, uh, uh, the uh, um, construction of the public buildings being, being accessible, were driven by demand side pressures. In other words, this wasn't a response to public, changing public preferences or the pressure of, of any kind of social movement or organization. Right? Uh, in fact, the Architectural Barriers Act was sponsored by uh, Alaska Senator Bob Bartlett. What was his motivation? His legislative aide, uh, who had a disability, couldn't access the National Gallery, and that troubled him and moved him. Okay? So this is important. Mario Biaggi, in 1970, sponsored an amendment to the Urban Mass Transportation Act. Uh, and that required that all vehicles, public transit vehicles, had to be made accessible. Now remember that the Architectural Barriers Act did not deal with vehicles. It dealt with the buildings. Right? So this was important because now the vehicles had to be made accessible. This is 1970. Okay? But why, what was his motivation? Well, it's not particularly clear. He, was, he had just been elected and he had no ties to disability or that policy area. But um, it, for some people who have interviewed him have speculated that he was actually just looking for a cost to champion to further his political career. And then finally, former Vice President Hubert Humphrey, in 1971, uh, along with Charles Vanek, sought an amendment to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to include disability as grounds for discrimination. Why was, what was his motivation? Well, he was partly motivated by his granddaughter, who had Down syndrome, and she was recently refused access to kindergarten. And he used words in the congressional record like the hypocrisy of America to refer to disability-based discrimination, especially, of course, in education. Now, the second important socio-political development at this time was not just that political entrepreneurship and these policy innovations, but is that it generated conflict around what does disability mean from the point of view of policymaking. So the Architectural Barriers Act, the pursuit of equal transit rights ac accessibility, and even this, the pivotal Section 504 of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act, which established anti-discrimination language uh, for the first time, um, were generating conflict in terms of how disability should be treated or understood by the federal government. Now, it's important to keep in mind, remember I, earlier I said disability rights enter the policy agenda when there was already an existing understanding about how we, what we should do with disability from a policy point of view. Well, in fact, the Banking and Currency Committee, who had jurisdiction over public transit, uh, was already dealing with transportation issues as part of the government's effort to, for, of urban renewal to get people to take public transit again. Um, but they didn't see a problem with, for example, a separate but equal system of, of transit. For, uh, I think it was called Dial-A-Ride, right? So it wasn't about making transit accessible to people with disabilities. Why can't they just call a service and they can just use that, right? And, and so this was, this was the kind of thinking at, at that time. They were, they were already dealing with the, these issues, right? The Justice Committee, which traditionally dealt, dealt with the civil rights um, with civil rights laws, expressed little interest in opening the Civil Rights Act to talk about disability. I mean, these things just didn't go together. I mean, there was still a cognitive barrier here. People were not making those associations between disability, which historically had been seen as, oh, people with disabilities are clients of, of rehabilitative services, not as a minority group entitled to rights. So these things just didn't go. But political entrepreneurs, like, for example, Senator Harrison Williams, created the Senate Subcommittee on the Handicapped uh, in 1972. Uh, stacked with disability rights entrepreneurs, it soon became heavily involved with the Vocational Rehabilitation Act amendments, which is really the law that was passed in 1920, uh, renewed in 1954, uh, um, where they attached a, an amendment that in, um, basically inserted civil rights statutory language okay, in a law that otherwise had nothing to do with civil rights. 
you know, otherwise nothing to do with civil rights. And most of this actually happened outside the hearings process, largely outside of public view. Um, and in fact, this was the birth of Section 504 of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act, which was the precursor to the pivotal 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act, which we hear about all the time. Political entrepreneurs then moved on to other areas. So for example, they passed the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, which is, um, it was later renamed ID, IDEA or IDEA, uh, requiring every reasonable effort to integrate disabled students into regular and mainstream classrooms and schools. But these efforts caused a lot of friction between policy networks. And so the third development was the rise of a, a, an organized backlash to disability rights. So government agencies regulating these various areas, because you know, we are talking about different areas. We, there's health, education, public transit. Right? These are areas that are governed by different policy networks, different committees okay, in Congress, different state policy stakeholders. Right? And, and so these government agencies that are regulating these various sectors found themselves dealing with okay, a commitment to civil rights on the one hand, and then tremendous pushback from their respective policy holders. So in, in fact, the, the two areas that were the first and most vocal about against disability rights enforcement were education and public transit, public education and public transit, because they were the first two that were most immediately affected. Public transit authorities and their interest group, APTA, which is the American Public Transit Association, vehemently opposed equal access, especially the phrase that we, was used by disability rights entrepreneurs as um, um, the same right as everyone else. That was, the, if you look at the record, which I, I mean, I content to analyze 1,275 hearings, that was the thing that came up the most. They, they objected every time that that was brought up, they objected to that terminology. The same right as everyone else. One school board superintendent testified that disability rights will completely destroy all control of schools. So it's important to remember um, that you know, this is the um, emerging rhetoric of that time. And the reason why it's important is not just so because in and of itself important, but that this language is used over and over again and continues to be in the 90s, in the 2000s, in whatever we call this decade of the 2010s, I guess. Um, so, and so this is why this is so important to look back at, at this kind of stuff. So these detractors, their efforts, made it very difficult for subsequent administrations to carry out any enforcement of disability rights. In fact, for the first four years uh, following the enactment of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act, there really weren't any published regulations, and so it made enforcement of the law very difficult. No one really knew what this enforcement was going to look like. So eventually, these opponents would find allies in the Reagan administration, which actively undermined equal access legislation. But part of their success, and this is important, part of their success involves how they frame their opposition. They weren't going around saying, you know, we're against disability rights. But rather, they focused their attention on costs, okay, inefficiencies, that you're undermining services for the many to provide services for the few, that no one really stands to benefit from any of these legislative innovations. One representative from the National Center for Law and the Handicap foresaw the future when he said, the fiscal, and this is a quote, the fiscal argument will always be brought up and will always be there three more years and three more years and we are dealing with the civil rights of people. And it was and it still is today. And finally, the last important socio-political development that was in this period of time in the 70s and 80s was the rise of contentious politics. The late 70s and early 80s signaled a shift from innovation to retrenchment on policy. Institutional activists soon found themselves in an increasingly hostile environment to push the disability rights agenda forward. It became clear to disability rights entrepreneurs and activists that the system of rights that had emerged was one that was separate and unequal. That whatever the power of the civil rights community um, and any enforcement mechanism associated with the Civil Rights Act would not apply to people with disabilities. So despite its promise, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act was really the first great political compromise on civil rights. And consequently, it marked the beginning of some of the most contentious politics and disruptive mobilization by new disability political advocacy groups that emerged in the late 70s and early 1980s. Detractors increasingly saw the goals of these advocacy groups as totally impractical, that, they are, that all they do is, quote, raise expectations, as one director of special education programs put it. 
So I'll show you one last graph, and I promise that's the last one. Um, and in this graph, uh, this is based on my uh, content analysis of uh, almost 1,000 disability organizations from 1961 to 2006. And I'm focusing only on this period here that I, I'm referring to. And what this shows is three lines. These three lines each represent the rise or decline of service provision groups, advocacy groups, and a hybrid of service and advocacy organizations. And uh, the, li the yellow lines indicate uh, sort of, I guess, I momentous or important policy periods. And what this is showing is that overall, there has been a decline in the number <coughs> of, s of the, in the proportion of the disability nonprofit sector that is composed of strict service provision organizations. I like to refer to those as the classic traditional model of disability groups that had been around since the late 1800s in the United States. Uh, doesn't mean that they were completely supplanted, just that they declined in their, in their relative proportion. B but what's important here is there was also a rise in advocacy just at around the same time. So in other words, as service provision organizations became a less significant share of the disability nonprofit sector, advocacy or organizations and hybrid advocacy and service organizations became a larger share of that sector. Okay? And, and, this, is, and this is important. Uh, why is this important? Because remember this, this kind of retrenchment and backlash. It's important to remember that that new rights language that was introduced by political entrepreneurs, for example, in Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, shaped the political space around which advocates and lawmakers were working. Rights policies shifted the demand for organizational inputs towards advocacy as opposed to the more traditional strict service provision. So again, and I mean not to, be, not, not to harp on this particular point, I mean I mentioned it earlier, but remember, as I, I noted earlier, that this policy area was really old. It was really old. This is a very well-defined def def organizational field or of, of nonprofit organizations, right? Everyone knew the March of Dimes, the Easter Seals, Goodwill, the National Federation of the Blind. I mean, some of these organizations were already 100 years old by this period of time, okay? And also, this was a very large nonprofit sector. By the 1950s, between, okay, by the 1950s, it, there were already hundreds and hundreds of disability groups. But between 61 and 72, which is part of what this graph covers, so just, that, just before the Rehabilitation Act was passed, the sector grew by another 67%. It grew by another 67%. But importantly, not only did it expand, but it also changed. It was changing. It was adapting. Political threats and the backlash to rights did a great deal to generate this demand for advocacy, for political advocacy. In the late 70s and early 80s, which was a period characterized as by backstepping and cutbacks, right, um, 51 disability groups moved away from strict service provision, and most of that shift actually happened within a very short period of time, within three years, within three years. And most of that was a direct result of the kind of continued sort of stalling on imp implementing Section 504 regulations. Why don't we have an enforcement mechanism for disability rights legislation? And these organizations are largely a result of that sort of we've got to do something about this because legislators aren't doing their, aren't, aren't able to um, overcome these institutional barriers, okay? Uh, this is the period of time where groups like the Disability Rights Center emerged, um, the National Center for Law and the Handicapped, right? And they all were in effect created to pressure the government to make good on civil rights. Remember, this is after the legislation was already passed, not before. So th two things were happening then. Existing groups like March of Dimes and the Easter Seals, which were increasingly seen as derelict, began to ad add political advocacy to their strategy. And second, newly founded groups, uh, like new groups of that period of time, were like Disabled in Action, for example, and, and ADAPT, right, were founded entirely around political advocacy. So these were these long-lasting effects of policy change. So di they, these diverse groups came together, right, to lobby Congress, working with sympathetic political elites, now trying to protect rights that were already enshrined in the law, right? By 1982, about 20 groups, including newer organizations like the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities, or ACCD, um, and the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, or DREDF, as well as established groups like Easter Seals and NARC, formed the Consortium Concerned with Developmentally Disabled to fight against rollbacks in rights to mainstream education. 
right? Groups like the ACCD testified repeatedly that n regardless of the area, whether it was transportation, whether it was education or mainstreaming, um, whether it was community-based care, that policies already allowed what's called, and this comes up a lot, a local option, right? So the government leaves it up to the states or local units to have some sort of public transit, uh, accessibility requirement, to have something like that. I shouldn't use the word requirement because that's the exact problem. These were never required. The local options always had the option. But the, the claim that disability groups were making was, but they're not doing it. So this is why we need the federal government's involvement in this area. There, there already is a local option. They're not, taking, they're not using that local option to actually advance a civil rights agenda. So these org advocacy organizations became very important because they became the mobilizing structures that really gave rise to the modern disability rights movement. Threat is a powerful motivator. Um, protests weren't really about trying to gain access to the political process. Remember, most of these organizations and leaders had access to the political process. They, they already had that access. This was about reinstating rights and raising public awareness. Because remember, a lot of this was happening. People weren't, and the public wasn't really aware of what was going on. In fact, a lot of uh, people who have covered this period of time have documented that much of the political change that was going on with rights wasn't even being proliferated to dis the disability community. A lot of this was be behind the scenes. It wasn't a very particularly salient topic. But what these groups did was very important because they took this fight to the streets and outside of just immediate government policy circles. And this is very important for, for, for mobilization, for, for a, a sustaining a broad social movement, right? The 1980s were seen as a civil rights counter-revolution. And this the, isn't just for disability, right? Uh, in fact, uh, black civil rights movement, basically civil rights was under attack. And, and this actually created an, uh, an atmosphere where disability organizations worked with other groups, like for example, the NAACP, uh, the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, um, the National Women's Law Center. They turned to Congress to help limit the administration's attacks and rollbacks on, uh, and rollbacks on civil rights. And in fact, what's really interesting about disability groups is their tactical and strategic flexibility. Okay? Um, activists came to focus on both the use of disruptive collective action, right, like protests that are you know, um, uh, sit-ins, for example. Uh, but they also um, were working with sympathetic policy elites directly in, in, uh, d working directly on new policy proposals. Public transit, for example, generated some of the most intense conflict throughout the 1980s and 90s. Even well after the Americans with Disabilities Act, right, which is seen as a sort of emancipation proclamation for people with disabilities, well, even after the ADA was passed, these um, the protests around equal transit continued. There were dozens of transit-related protests in DC, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Cincinnati, Dallas, Denver, Atlanta. Um, and, and a key goal of ADAPT, which was uh, uh, heavily involved in organizing these protests, was to show everyone what it means to be left out. These groups did everything from occupying Department of Transportation offices to chaining themselves to buses. The goal was not couched necessarily in changing federal government policies per se, or at least directly, but to address the immediate local problems of equal access. ADAPT emerged as one of the most militant groups in the disability rights struggle. By the end of the 1980s, it was clear that protests weren't having much of a direct influence on federal policy making, or, on, or at least on the, federal, on the uh, policy agenda. But they were shaping attitudes. And I have this one quote in, when I was doing my content analysis. Uh, it was an interview of a, a DC Metro bus driver. And he said, no, I sympathize with these people. Probably they have some legitimate beefs. These protests reveal that policy victories weren't really victories at all. And that the efforts of, of political entrepreneurs and their institutional activism only went so far. But the late 1980s showed signs of change in government. The federal government had, began, had begun addressing grievances uh, through disability policy making in a series of uh, uh, po legislative proposals, uh, which eventually led to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And ironically, uh, I believe it was the, one of the leaders of DREDF, the, the disability rights group, pointed out that Reagan's attacks would actually allow for a disability policy renaissance in the late 1980s. That was a direct response to, his, to the retrenchment that was going on in the earlier part of that decade. So the ADA was actually part of that momentum in Congress. 
to restore the original intentions of Section 504, which were passed in 1973, so many years late, earlier, right? And to also rectify perverse court rulings. Along with the Civil Rights Restoration Act, it was, this period of time was referred to, to by many disability advocates as like the third wave of civil rights. Activism, especially by organizations working closely with political elites, was instrumental in getting the ADA on the policy agenda. But, you know, but perhaps more importantly was actual political entrepreneurship on the Republican side. Right? It was entrepreneurship within the Republican Party. Remember, in 1990, who was president of the United States? It was George Bush. Okay? So people like jo Justin Dart, John McCain, people who you still know today, Bob Dole, Orrin Hatch, Stephen Gunderson, Durenberger, and Lowell Weaker, all Republicans, working to get their colleagues to support the Americans with Disabilities Act. But the ADA and other policy proposals also reopened old debates about disability rights. Equal access to transit, which continued to worry APTA, which was the Public Transit Association, the lobby group, right, for, for public transit authorities. What kinds of remedies would be available to plaintiffs? So if they were to sue, for example. The Sensenbrenner Amendment sought to limit remedies. And perhaps more fundamentally, what is disability? Should HIV AIDS be considered part of a, a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act? I mean, this and the broader argument against having communicable diseases covered under the ADA was a major sticking point and stalled the negotiations on that law. Groups like Paralyzed Veterans of America and ACT UP were increasingly involved in pushing for the ADA, and they raised public awareness about what was going on with the ADA. But it didn't do much to soy opponents. No doubt pressured by the National Restaurant Association, the Chapman Amendment was introduced, which would allow restaurants to reassign employees with a communicable disease to an alleged comparable job. So the ADA then also re-energized opponents. Rather than settling the rights question once and for all, opponents successfully framed this law too as just another liberal, burdensome regulatory policy. And it too was a product of political compromises. You know, despite opponents claiming that it was shoved down people's throats and rushed through Congress, it's important to bear in mind that it was actually reviewed by four different congressional committees, and it took two years to be enacted, and then another two years for it to take effect. So, and to the dismay of activists and disability rights entrepreneurs, the period following the ADA can only be characterized by problems of enforcement and continued judicial resistance by the courts. Alas, the ADA too had to be restored. The ADA Restoration Act hearings began in 2006. But here too, detractors rehashed the same arguments used against the ADA. It too underwent a compromising process. <laughs> For starters, they dropped the word uh, restoration from the title, and it became the ADA Amendments Act. They weakened the burden of proof requirements on employers and ensured that not all impairments would de facto be considered disability. So these hearings revealed two important aspects about American policymaking and American policy reform. The first is that policies even as fundamental as those governing or dealing with civil rights require restoration after years of retrenchment. The second has to do with the growing chasm between different policy stakeholders. Right? It grew even when disability rights legislation had been in place for decades. Um, so for example, where disability rights activists saw perverse court rulings that were undermining the ADA, Detractors saw the courts as protecting states' rights. And still, 30 years later, two completely different worldviews about what was going on with disability rights. So the question is, did this settle any of these underlying existing problems and debates and understandings? So what are some takeaways from the talk and from the book? So what I want to emphasize in this talk, and, and of course the, the book, are that policies don't end with politics. Policies do not end with, pol uh, politics do not end with policies, sorry. I'm emphasizing the consequences of how policies get made, especially in shifting uh, both institutional and cultural understandings uh, about social problems, disadvantage, inequalities, uh, civil rights, and the intersection of these areas. The political evolution of disability showcases a cyclical nature shaped by American institutional arrangements. So ironically, the same things that allow a lunging forward, right, the production of these policy innovations, are actually the same things that allow for retrenchment. 
They create these unsettled fields and undesirable policy outcomes. Disability rights isn't an aberration of US policymaking, nor is it an aberration in the uh, uh, political process. I also highlight the relationship between so-called insiders and outsiders. We need to shed more light on the connections between elite and mass politics. When do they align? When don't they align? It's important to pay attention to the demand side and supply side processes that shape social and political change. Now, with that said, my account illustrates both the virtues and the problems of political entrepreneurship and the problems associated with institutional activism. I mean, after all, didn't political entre entrepreneurship ultimately produce a separate but unequal system of rights? And one cannot ignore the compromising process that got legislation enacted that the optics of getting something, something done um, can outweigh the actual origin, original intentions of that legislation. Does this point to the limits of elite politics? Does this, in the end, um, delegitimize a policy, um, allowing it to remain unsettled, which makes it a lot easier to attack or undermine? Why haven't policies developed those positive feedback mechanisms, especially in terms of implementation and enforcement, that are so critical in shaping attitudes and beliefs? Does this explain why attitudes haven't changed enough over the last 40, 50 years, despite the fact that there, have been, there has been disability rights legislation in the United States for that long of a period of time? So I make the case for the importance of mass politics in shaping not just the policy agenda, which is the big focus of the book, but also the general discourse and public perceptions of these issues. The disability rights struggle showcases how, showcases how everyday politics can turn into disruptive action. Because these two things develop and evolve together over a period of time. Social movements and policy evolve together over a long period of time. And I believe that understanding these episodes of conten contention makes most sense when you place it in this kind of policy participation cycle of innovation, retrenchment, mobilization, and then again, restoration. And that's it. So I'm just going to put my last shameless self-promotion slide um, <laughs> here. Um, but thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to having a, a conversation either in question and answer or, or later with you. Thank you.